And we're going to teach you a new song today, and it's called Abide. And it comes directly from John chapter 15. And I'm going to read a little bit of that here. Abide in me, and I in you. These are the words of Jesus. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. I love that. I love those um, passages of scripture. Um, one of my favorites. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. And later on in that chapter, he talks about us no longer being called servants, but we are called friends. And we are called his friends because we abide in him, that we spend time with him, that we remain in him. And it's more than just having a quiet time, you know, just reading your reading by the Bible and praying once in the morning or whenever you do your quiet time. But it's constantly being tied to Jesus all day long, every day, and not trying to control things on your own, but allowing him to take control and for you to just remain in him. So we're going to sing the song together. Won't you sing it? I deep 
Yes, God, today we are grateful that we can abide in you and that you abide in us. God, help us to be encouraged today that you are with us and help us to see ourselves as you see us. In the doubts and in the struggles, God, you are with us every step of the way. Help us to seek you, help us to cry out to you, and most importantly, help us to trust in you, to trust that you are holding us and that you are carrying us and that you are leading us. God, we are grateful for your love. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to worship at DCC. My name is Mia and I want to make sure you get connected. Whether you are a new visitor or regular attender, simply scan the QR code on the seat in front of you to fill out a connection card where you can sign up for next steps, send in a prayer request, and find upcoming events. And if you're part of the DCC family, we want to thank you for your generosity through tithes and offerings. Your continued support fuels our mission and we are so grateful. September 29th is Serve Sunday. This is a day set aside to intentionally serve our community together. This September, we'll be partnering with the Bear Foundation to support foster families with a diaper drive. Bless these families by donating diapers of any size, wipes, and diaper creams on September 29th, and join us for a potluck after second service. Healthy relationships are at the heart of a thriving life, and we want to intentionally strengthen our connections. Join us next Sunday as we begin our new study series called Relationships. We have valuable resources and engaging material prepared to help us embody the fruit of the Spirit in all relationships, including a four-week Sunday morning parenting workshop beginning September 29th, a Monday evening workshop designed to divorce-proof your marriage, small group material, a podcast with our counseling partners, and a devotional wrote by DCC members. Take advantage of these resources and sign up for workshops by scanning the QR code or by clicking the online tab at dccwire.org. Let's begin building Christ-centered connections. If you're looking to get connected with a small group to take full advantage of our relationship series resources, stop by the small group table in the cafe where you can meet Susan, our small group director, ask her questions and hear about our groups. We would love to see everyone plugged into a group for this upcoming series. Are you still looking for the village you assumed would arrive alongside your baby? Good news, we've built one for you. MomCo Meetups are the motherhood community you've been craving. Join a meetup locally or online to connect to other moms who get it, even if your it is heavy or sticky or sleep deprived. We have moms meeting across the world in every season and stage of motherhood, so we can basically guarantee that no one will be surprised by your toddler's meltdowns or your preteen's mood swings. In a meetup, you will join your new mom friend to learn from our amazing MomCo curriculum, discuss the daily struggles and joy of mom life, and have some fun, all to help you feel like you again. You'll lighten the load by learning to rely on each other, and you'll find a village that has your back in the thick of it. Good morning. 
Good morning. It is a very special day for us here at DCC. As you see, we have some families that have joined us up here this morning for a child dedication, um, as you've just seen on the video. So um, let's go ahead without further ado and meet some of the families that are um, going to be publicly uh, sharing their uh, desire to raise their child to know Christ. My name's Hooch Mondin, this is my wife Haley, and today we're dedicating Joseph. Hi, I'm Deborah Rigsby, this is my husband Justin, and today we're dedicating, dedicating both Eugene and Mabel. Hi, I'm Rudy, this is my wife Madison, and today we're dedicating our daughter Sophia. Just pass her right along. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Josh Bryant, and this is my wife Tasha. I pulled that away from myself, but this is Kenine and Xavier, and we're dedicating them today. Daniel. Awesome, awesome. Well, today, as Amanda said, my name is Danny. For most of you who don't know me, we are also dedicating our son, Zachariah. And I'm Danny, and this is Amanda, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, but as she said, today's a special day for us at DCC. It's a day of celebration, a day of commitment, as all these parents here dedicate their children to the Lord. Delaware Christian Church has set aside a, a Sunday each year to affirm families and to call upon our entire church body to covenant with the children growing up among us. Dedicating to the children of the Lord is, is, is also, we see this model in the scriptures. This dedication today is not about just today. It's a commitment to guide our children in the ways of the Lord, teaching them his truths and modeling a life of faith. Remember, we are never alone in this journey. God is with us every step of the way, and so is your church family. Now, we recognize that each child is a gift from God. And we don't often think of it this way, but the child in our care is first his child, created in his image, and he has entrusted them to our stewardship. So we have come here today to commit ourselves to this stewardship and to pray for God's guidance. You are charged as parents to pass on God's values to your children. So by the time that they're accountable, they are trained up in the way they should go, as Proverbs reminds us. <clears throat> we have to care for as much of this as their spiritual development as we do their physical, mental, and emotional development. Ephesians 6.4 actually challenges us to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Parents, you have been entrusted with a beautiful gift, a life full of promise and potential. As you bring your child before God today, you are acknowledging that his hand is in your family, committing you to raise your child in a home filled with love, faith, and prayer. Now, we take the vow of the parents. strength? Will you promise to raise your child to know of Jesus' love and his salvation through grace? Will you take responsibility to seriously pray for them, show them his word and his ways, bring them to church and be godly examples? Will you plan to participate and serve in the church body for the benefits and the blessings that come through a community of believers? And will you commit to seek God for his guidance in this journey? If so, say, I will. I will. <laughs> I All right. I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> to the church, today we come together united as a body of Christ to witness and celebrate this great moment of joy. Why is this important? You see, these families need you. Families are being destroyed each and every day. The enemy, the Bible tells us, is roaming around like a roaring lion to seek to devour those he can find. As a church, we have the privilege and the responsibility to support these parents and their precious children in their journey of faith. We are not just observers today. We are participants committing ourselves to be a source of love, a source of encouragement, and spiritual guidance for these families. Together we stand as a community that believes in the power of prayer, the strength of God's word, and the beauty of walking in faith with him. Let us with one heart and one voice commit to being a village that nurtures, a village that prays, and a village that uplifts these children as they grow in their knowledge of the Lord and his love. As we make this commitment today, we do so with joy, knowing that God has called us to be a part of something beautiful, a life dedicated to his purpose and filled with his blessings. 
And we encourage each one of you to remember a name or two of those being dedicated and pray for them today, tomorrow, in the weeks, months, and years to come. We have been commissioned to make disciples for his kingdom. Each child has a path with a plan and a purpose, and we cannot afford to miss the opportunity to raise them up as kingdom workers. This is our chance to stand behind these parents, offering our support, our prayers, and encouragement. And together, we form a community that nurtures, a community that helps these children cheer them on as they grow in their relationship with God. Let us affirm our support for these families today. DCC and family and friends of those of uh, you that are up here today, will you commit yourselves as the body of Christ to encourage these parents in the task of leading and training their children in God's word as they endeavor to fulfill their responsibilities to this child? Will you dedicate time to praying for the young children growing up around us, and will you respond to God by being a living example of Christ's love to these little ones? If so, please answer, we will. We will. All right. I'm going to close and pray. If I can ask, if you wouldn't mind holding out your hands towards these families as we pray over them today. Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and joy for the precious lives that are being dedicated today. We put these parents before you, O oh Lord, to grant them the wisdom and the strength and the patience as they raise their child in your ways. We ask, Lord, that you would fill their home with peace. Let it be a place where faith is lived out daily. May they find joy in every moment of, and trust in your guidance through every challenge. Help them to be examples of your love, and may their hearts remain steadfast in the calling you've placed upon them. Father, as a church family, we commit to walking alongside these families. May we be a source of encouragement to each other, offering a helping hand when needed, and to celebrate the milestones along the way. And Father, we thank you for each and every child that's on the stage today, and we ask for your divine blessing in their lives. Surround them with your love and protect them. We pray that they will come to know you deeply, love you passionately, and to serve you faithfully. May their life be a testimony of your goodness, and may they shine brightly in the world that needs your light. Father, as we close, I recall the, the blessing that we read in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 and 25. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and grant you peace. Father, we hold on to this promise today and forevermore. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Please congratulate these families. You know why I messed up already? Because it's cold outside. <laughs> Unbelievable. I was like, how in the world we are in September? And I don't know if you know this. This is a true information this morning. It was colder here than in Alaska. <laughs> true story. One of the church members in the first service was like, Pastor Sam, how you like this cold? And I was like, shut up. <laughs> and... <laughs> And then uh, I was like, yeah, you know, I don't like it. He's like, well, this might make you feel like it'll feel even worse. I was like, why? He's like, it is colder here than in Alaska. And he showed me how I was like, you got to be kidding me. It's only September. That means, can I start complaining already? <laughs> September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh. I don't know about that. I don't, I'm worked up already. Hey, I'm, 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 if it's your first time here, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, my name is Sam. I'm the senior pastor here. I'm originally from Brazil. I like the hot weather. And, uh, and this summer was great, but it hurts the heart of a pastor when the cold is coming and the warmth is gone. Uh, before I get into the message today, uh, there's one thing that I, I want to say. I want to say thank you, Delaware Christian Church, for First Friday. Guys, that was awesome. It was amazing. Yes, you should clap for yourself. It was amazing serving our community together. Uh, we were downtown, and, and so many families were enjoying the time. There was a little bit of a fear if it's going to rain a lot, and we were a little scared, but we asked and we prayed that God would hold on the rain, and he did for the most part. Only ran for about half an hour uh, th there, and even though through the, the mist, we, were not, we could continue the, the games to, to be played, just the band had to stop, but everything else continued, which was great. We felt God's blessing over us, and we felt like we were able to fulfill our goal, uh, to be able to fulfill our call 
to be able to fulfill that which God has called us, Delaware Christian Church, to do, which is to serve the families in our community. So it was great. It was a great, uh, it was a great Friday, and I'm thankful. I'm humble. Every, I tell this often. I'm humble to be part of a church that loves their community, not by speaking it out, by showing it that we are for our community. So, uh, yeah, I'm thankful for all, the, all of you who participated in the parade or that also part from the outside looking in. So thank you so much. Before, uh, let, me, let me talk about about this for a second. Starting next week, we're going to be on a relationship series. Uh, you saw Mia talked about all the things that, all the resources that we have put together in order to help you uh, 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 just uh, um, focus a little bit on the, on this specific um, uh, 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 aspect of our lives that's called relationship. We know this for a fact that the, our health depends on the quality of the, of the relationships we have around us. Uh, the, the, the quality of your life is dependent on the health of your relationships. So we, we created this sermon series on relationships to equip you. Uh, we are giving, so we have all kinds of resources that if you put it all together, will help you to have a better quality in your relationships. We have ser uh, sermons on Sunday morning. We have a small group Bible study that we recorded that we put it together for you. Of course, you can do that by yourself, but we encourage you to be part of a small group. I mean, we have young adult small groups for those who are single to all kind of other small groups out there. Uh, there is always room for you to be part of one. So don't go through this journey alone. Uh, join a small group. Oh, Pastor Samuel, I don't want to commit for life. That's fine. Just commit throughout this series to be part of this small group, to walk with people as we learn together. And then after that, you can say, yeah, this is not for me, or you're like, you know what, I like this experience. I want to keep meeting a small group. So there's a small group, a small group Bible study. There's a podcast that Danny and I record, and then we're going to bring the counselors that's going to be helping us through this season. Uh, and then we have a devotional uh, that was composed by church members that is, uh, that is, that was, that is very powerful. And we have singles, uh, singles workshop. We have marriage workshop. We have parenting workshop. We have finance, financial uh, life workshop. All those workshops work together in, in order for you to invest in the relationships so that you have a healthier life, right? So uh, we are really excited and we are praying that God would change and would, uh, would bring health to our relationships so that our quality of life would would increase. So uh, I will be. I pray that uh, you would uh, participate in all these resources that uh, we're putting before you. And I promise you, I don't make any promises. God's word promises us that if we put God at the center of our lives, at the center of relationships, He will bless us and prosper us. So uh, with that said, let me pray, and we'll go into the message today, uh, which is about children dedication. Father God, we praise you and worship you for who you are. You are amazing, God. Uh, we love you so much, God, and you have given us uh, so so many blessings and and we are thankful and humble the fact that you love us that even though we were sinner you loved us you died while we were enemy for us to to rescue us to save us from the grips of sin and the enemy and you have uh, promised eternal life to us so I pray that this morning, as we learn a little bit about uh, uh, this idea, this uh, biblical uh, teaching of ded de child dedication, that we would um, just uh, uh, continue to practice biblical truths in our lives, so to live a life that glorifies you and honor those around us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your whole name we pray. Amen. Amen. A lot of people co come to a, to a church and, and, and they're like, well, why do they do the things that they do? And the child dedication is one of those things that people are like, like what, what do you, why does churches do this, right? And there's a whole idea of child dedication versus infant baptism. And, and I, I hope this morning to tackle all of that and to give you a concise answer why uh, Delaware Christian Church participate on child dedication instead of infant baptism. And we, we are, this is the day that is excited to us. Parents dedicating their children to the Lord is inspiring and it's encouraging and mostly it's biblical. And today we're going to explore the story, a very touching story, very inspiring story, an enlightened story found in the Old Testament, the story of Hannah and her son Samuel. Throughout this sermon, uh, we will explore the, the deep significance of dedicating our children to the Lord, why we do that according to Scripture and sound doctrine. We should prefer dedication. 
That will be the, will be the point that I, I will make. The practice of child, child dedication finds its roots in the scripture. And, and it is a, a, a tradition that we as followers of Christ should cherish, should celebrate, should respect and uphold. Through the, lives, through the lives of Hannah and Samuel, God reveals to us a pattern of faith, a pattern of prayer, a, pr- a pattern of dedication that stood the task of time. As we journey through this uh, story today, I will also offer theological insights on why we here at the Love Our Christian Church do not practice infant baptism, but, uh, but uh, focus on dedicating our children to the Lord, entrusting our kids and families to God's care and guidance as our kids grow and as we parents mature in faith. Let's focus on the story of, of Hannah, a journey of faith. Uh, that's what I would like to begin, recounting the story of Hannah, a woman uh, of profound faith and deep longing. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, which is the chapter that uh, this story comes out to us, as you're, uh, I would like to give you homework today, uh, this week, to spend some time in the book of 1 Samuel and start with chapter 1. We, we are introduced to a woman who is barren, no kids, deeply troubled earnestly praying for the Lord, to, uh, to, for God to give her child. Hannah's story is one of a heartbreak and hope, despair and divine intervention. Hannah was married to this guy, his name was Elkanah, who loved her dearly, but she had no children. And that brought some bitterness and some troubles to her, to her heart and her mind. And this was a, so, a source of great sorrow for Hannah, especially because her husband's other wife, Penina, had children and often making fun of Hannah for the fact that Hannah did not have kids, making her misery even worse. Despite the love of her husband, the support of her husband, Hannah, Hannah's heart was heavy with, with the burden of childlessness. Year after year, Hannah would go to the house of the Lord in Silo, where she would pour out her heart in prayer. Her prayers were not a distant routine prayers. No, this was a cry that came out of her soul, from the, uh, a cry out for, that came from deep distress, from sorrow, from suffering. And in her distress, she made a vow to the Lord. And this is the vow that she made. Verse 11 says this, O Lord of hosts, If you will indeed look at the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of my life, and no razor shall touch his head. In the midst of her turmoil, she come praying to God, and she vowed to God that if, she, if God gave her a son, she would return that gift back to God. It is here that we see uh, uh, is the first indication of what true dedication is all about. Hannah was willing to offer back to God the very thing she desired most in life. Wow. Do you trust God enough to surrender your deepest desires to him, knowing that he will fulfill them in ways beyond your greatest hope? She was prepared to dedicate her child to the Lord, recognizing that the gift of a child would be from God, and therefore the child ultimately belonged to God himself. This is not just a story about motherhood. It is a story, uh, is a story about faith, about surrender, about trust. It is a story that challenges us to consider what we hold most dear in our own lives. He begs the questions, what is the one thing that we have prayed for, longed for, worked tirelessly to achieve? What is the precious desire that we treasure above all else? It could be a relationship. 
It could be a career. It could be a dream. It could be the well-being of a loved one. Whatever it is, the question we must ask ourselves is this. Are we willing to offer it back to God? Are we willing to participate on what Hannah participated in? In a prayer being answered by God, but that answer is not, the, 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 it's not it. It's not the end. It's actually a means to an end, which is a better relationship with God. Hannah's willingness to surrender her deepest desire challenges, challenges me to examine my heart. Am I holding on to something so tightly that, I, that I'm unwilling to trust God with it? Am I afraid that if we let go, if I let go, if I, I, I will lose it forever? The truth is, anything that we hold to more tightly than we hold on to God can become an idol in our lives. And idols, no matter how good or noble they might appear, ultimately lead us away from the peace and the fulfillment that God can, that only God can bring to us. I have, Lauren, I have uh, in the last couple of months have uh, wrestled with this trust in God, right? Releasing, willing to, to give it back to God and trust God who with the life of our oldest son, Sam Jr. We just took him to college and we dropped the kid there and we had to trust God with his life. We're no longer around him all the time. We're not, not, not able to influence him the way that we were before. And here's the question, am I holding on too tight to the kid or can I uh, trust God with the life of my son? It is a noble cause to, to hold on to your kid. When they're growing up, you're like, get out of my house. And then they turn 18 and they go out, you're like, oh, he can stay a little bit more. I am afraid that at times parents hold on too tightly to their kids and don't trust their kids' life to God. I'm afraid that at times we, uh, a kid, our kids becomes our idols. And how, it doesn't matter how good or noble it is, ultimately it will take us away from fulfillment and peace that only God can bring. The challenge before us is not, is not an easy one. It requires, uh, to, uh, require us to trust, to trust in God's goodness. Even when we feel like we are letting go something that we can't, uh, uh, something you can't bear to lose. It requires us to believe that God's plan for us are better than our own. Even when those plans take us in unexpected directions and with unexpected re, uh, uh, re, uh, results, it is important to understand that God's plan is greater than ours. It requires us to surrender, not out of fear or submission, but out of a deep abiding trust in God who loves us. And knows what is best for us and for our kids. The story of Hannah continues with the answer of prayer. We see that God uh, hear, uh, hears um, Hannah's fer uh, fervent prayer. Uh, the priest Eli, who initially mistook her uh, to be drunk as she was praying in the temple, so her mouth was moving, but uh, no voice was coming out. And uh, the, the priest was like, well, you're drunk. Uh, you know, and she's like, no, no, I'm not drunk. I'm just troubled in my heart. Eventually, that priest blessed her, saying, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you petition that you have made to him. This is verse 17. And God remembered Hannah. She conceived and bore a son whose name was Samuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. Verse 20 shows us that. Hannah's response to God's blessing is both beautiful and useful for us today in the 21st century. She did not forget her vow. And I think here's one of the, the, one of the biggest lessons I take from this lady is that she prayed to God. She has something that she desires so good, so much in her heart. She prayed to God. God answered her prayer and she did not forget God. She fulfilled her vow. She did not forget her vow. She did not hold selfishly to the child she had longed for. Instead, when time came, she brought Samuel to the house of the Lord in Silo. And this is what we read on verses 24 to 28. And when she had weaned Samuel, she took him up with her along with the three-year-old bull and ephah of flour 
and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Silo, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli the priest. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I pray, and the Lord has granted me my petition, the petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have let this kid, Samuel, to the Lord. I have led him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent, he is lent to the Lord. And he worships the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah's act of dedication was profound. She brought Sam, Samuel not merely to show him off, but to give him fully to the Lord's service. This was not just a symbolic act. It was a literal dedication of her child to a life of service in God's temple. Samuel would grow up in the presence of the Lord, learning the ways of God, and eventually become, became one of Israel's greatest prophets. And I think this is where the significance of dedication comes to us. The story of Hannah and Samuel serves as a powerful example of the importance, the significance of dedicating our children to the Lord. If I had to define dedication, I have a, uh, for you right there. Dedication is an act of faith, a declaration that we recognize our children, we as parents recognize our children as gifts from God, and that we entrust them to God's care and to God's purpose. When we dedicate our children, we are commit, we are committing ourselves to, ra to raise them in the knowledge of the Lord, to teach them His way, and to model them a life of faith. Hannah's dedication of Samuel was not just a personal act, but a statement of her trust in God's sovereignty and in God's goodness and greatness. She acknowledged that her son belonged to God, and she, she trusted that God had a plan for Samuel's life, plan that exceeds, exceeded her own plans. This act of dedication set the course for Samuel's life. As he grew up, he became a man of God. He became a great leader. He became a prophet who played a crucial role in the history of Israel. Let me tell you this. When we dedicate our families to God, God can do some amazing things through us. He can bring out of us great leadership, uh, great uh, gifts that are from the Spirit that will empower and encourage those around us. I'm afraid that at times we're dedicating our families to sports, to ideologies, to so many other things out there, instead of dedicating them to God, dedicating our families to God, that will set the, the, the tone for our families, not only now, but forever. So let me give you a theological perspective over infant baptism versus child dedication. While the dedication of a child is rooted in biblical narrative, the practice of infant baptism has been a subject of much debate within the Christian church. It is important uh, to understand why some traditions practice infant baptism and why we at Delaware Christian Church believe in dedicating children instead to the Lord instead of baptizing them. Those who advocate for, for, for infant baptism often do so on the basis of few key elements. So I'm not, uh, you know, there is more, but I, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll resume into three, the main three ones. The first one is covenant theology. The Catholic Church and some denominations, particularly uh, within the, the, the Reformed tradition, argue the baptism, the baptism in the New Testament is the equivalent of circumcision in the Old Testament which was the sign of the, of the covenant between God and Israel. Just as infants were circumcised under the Old Testament covenant, so too should infants be baptized under the new covenant as a sign of their inclusion in the community of faith. So the first arguments they make for infant baptism is the covenant theology. The second one is this. Household baptism. In the New Testament, there are several passages where, uh, in, in instances where entire households were baptized. 
Acts chapter 16 is a great example of that. That's another homework for you. You can read Acts chapter 16, especially verses 15 and 33. The proponents of infant baptism argue that this passage implied that children and infants were included in the baptism of those households. The third point that they often make is the grace of inclusion. The, the grace and inclusion. Some believe that baptism, even for infants, is a means of grace and a way of including them in the church from the earliest possible moment. If you are not baptized, you're not part of the church, therefore not saved. There is a biblical and, and, and theological response to those, and these arguments may seem compelling, uh, but they are not without significant theological and biblical challenges, though. Let us consider why we, as a congregation committed to biblical teaching, do not practice infant baptism, but instead advocate for the dedication of our children to the Lord. The first point I make is this, baptism is a sign of faith. In the New Testament, baptism is consistently presented as a sign of faith and of repentance. Acts chapter 2, verses 38. In, chapters, in, verse, in, in chapter 2, uh, Peter is giving this amazing sermon and, and uh, 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 displaying the gospel, teaching the people about the gospel, about who Jesus was, and he was the Messiah sent by God. And, and when people uh, heard it, they wanted to respond to the gospel. So they're like, how can we respond to the gospel? And Peter says this, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance, baptism, it is a response to the undertaking and the understanding of the gospel. That Jesus Christ came, he lived a perfect life, he died a perfect death, and now he's ascending with the Father, and that, and those who believe in him will be saved. So baptism follows repentance and belief. It is an outward expression of an inward change. Infants, however, are not capable of repentance or personal faith. Therefore, baptizing them does not align with the biblical pattern of baptism as, re, as a response to the gospel. I think it is clear in the book of Acts that those who heard the gospel, the message of Jesus, who Jesus was, and the blessings that we have in Jesus, the hope we have in Jesus, when they respond, they respond with repentance, turning away from their sin, and baptism. To the household, baptism uh, the instance of household baptism in the New Testament do not necessarily imply the infants were baptized. In each case, it is plausible that the entire household believed and were baptized together. For example, on, on chapter 16, the jailer says this, rejoiced, the jailer re rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. In chapter 16, for me, the point here is that they believed not that everyone was baptized, but that they believed in God. The emphasis is on belief, which again points to the necessity of personal faith prior to baptism. Covenant theology and baptism, while it's true that circumcision was a sign of the Old Testament covenant, the New Testament does not explicitly equate circumcision with baptism. Instead, the New Testament presents baptism as a sign of the believer's union with Christ in his death and his resurrection. As we learn in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, for those who have seen uh, us baptize individuals here, one of the verses that I read is, is, is Romans 6. Because in Romans 6, Paul unites us with Christ in our death, when we, in, in his death when we go under the water, and in the resurrection when we come out of the water for a new life, for the hope of grace that is found in Jesus himself. Baptism is a sign of a believer's union with Christ. Baptism signifies a spiritual reality that occurs in the life of someone who has made a personal and conscious decision to give their life to, to follow after Jesus through faith in Jesus Christ. This is a reality that infants, by their very nature, cannot yet experience 
They do not have the ability to make a personal and conscious decision. Well, Pastor Sam, what about Jesus and the children in Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 and 15? So at some point that Jesus' blessing uh, to the children uh, as the, is the basis for infant baptism. However, it is important to note that Jesus did not baptize the children. He blessed them. This act of blessing, in my opinion, is more in the, line, in the lines of, uh, of practicing dedication than really baptizing an individual. Jesus welcomed the children and blessed them, affirming their value and place in the kingdom of God, but he did not administer a sacrament of baptism to them. Hannah clearly illustrated to us the practice of dedicating children to the Lord. It is a practice that acknowledges God's sovereignty and our responsibility as parents to raise our children in faith. Dedication is not a sacrament, but is a, a significant spiritual act in which parents commit to, ra to raise their children in the knowledge and love of God. Trusting that in due time, the child will come to personal faith and choose to be baptized as a public profession of faith. And we parents, we play a crucial role, and so does the church in this dedication. As you see Amanda and Danny asking the parents and us to commit, dedication is not merely a one-time ceremony. It is the beginning of a journey, of a lifetime, lifelong journey for both the child, the parents, and for us, the church. When we dedicate our children to the Lord, we are making a covenant, a promise to, to raise the kids in a manner that honors God and points them to Christ. This commitment involves several key responsibilities from a parent's standpoint, teaching, the, uh, teaching faith. The parents are called to be the primary spiritual educators of their children. This involves reading the Bible to them, praying with them, uh, teaching them how to pray, bringing them to church, modeling a Christ-like life. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, we read this. God command uh, the people of Israel... And these words that I command you today shall be on your, head, on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lay down, and when you rise. We are responsible to teach, for teaching our kids God's word. But it's not only about teaching, it's about modeling Christ's love. Christ, uh, children learn by example. They observe and imitate the behaviors and the attitudes that they see, especially in their parents. Therefore, it is crucial that parents model the love of Christ in their homes, showing kindness, patience, forgiveness, and humility. I think so. when we read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, I think we put the emphasis in the wrong aspect of it. Uh, most people put the, uh, the, 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 the emphasis on the first statement, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That's cool, that's good, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The emphasis of that verse is on the second part, not on the first part, although the first part is important too. Uh, you know, you cannot instruct someone if you are uh, provoking them to anger. It is our responsibility to model Christ's love in our home by, this, by, by, uh, by bringing them up in the discipline and the structure of the Lord. Prayer. Just as Hannah prayed earnestly for, their, for her child, so too should parents be diligently in prayer for their children. Pray for their salvation. Pray, uh, pray for, their growth, for their spiritual growth, for their growth in, in faith. Uh, uh, pray for God's protection, for God's guidance uh, throughout uh, their lives. James chapter 5, 16 uh, brings peace to my heart when we read the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is, in wor is working. As a, as a dad now who has a kid who is in college, I have never prayed more fervently for my son than, I, uh, than this, this season of my life. I, I have to trust God with his life, and that's not a have because I, I, I'm obligated, not because I, I don't have any other way. God is everything for me, especially when it comes to the life of my son. So I... Uh, so, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 
But it's not about parents, it's about the church involvement too. The dedication of a child is also a, commit, a commitment that involves the church. The church community in, the, in, this, in this child's spiritual upbringing. The church plays a vital role in supporting the parents, providing biblical teachings, and offering fellowship and accountability. The church is a family, and as such, we all share the responsibility of nurturing the fate of the next generation. And here's why I'm very proud of Delaware Christian Church. Our family ministry uh, has, uh, has created a, a, um, all kinds of resources that bring parents together, that brings kids together in order to understand uh, and, and to grow in the image of Jesus. Let me conclude by saying this. We need to reflect on the profound example of Hannah and her dedication of Samuel to the Lord. Hannah's story is a powerful reminder that our children are gifts from God, entrusted to us for a time. But ultimately, our kids belong to him. They were not given to you so they will become idols in your life. But they were given to you so that you would care and love and give it back to the Creator. When we dedicate our children, we are acknowledging God's sovereignty committing ourselves to, to, to raise them in the faith and, and trusting that God will work in their hearts and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus. We do not practice infant baptism because we believe that baptism is a sign of personal faith, a step that each individual must take when they are able to understand and respond to the gospel. Instead, we dedicate our children following the biblical example of Hannah as an act of faith quick, and a commitment to God's will to their lives. In a world that is increasingly hostile to the Christian faith, the act of dedicating our children takes on an even greater significance. It is a bold declaration that we will raise our children to know and follow Jesus Christ that we will teach them the truths of Scripture, and that we will model for them a life of faith. Let us be faithful in our commitment to God and to our children. Let us pray, pray fervently, teach diligently, live out our faith with integrity and love. Let us trust that God, who is faithful, will honor our dedication and bring our children to a knowledge of Him a saving knowledge of Him, that they may one day stand before the church, not as infants, but as grown believers, ready to make their own profession of faith through the waters of baptism. We all, parents, we need God's blessing over us as we raise our children in the knowledge and the love of God. Let us pray fervently. Teach diligently and live out our faith with integrity and love. I'd like to transition to communion times. If you don't have a communion cup with you today, just raise your hand and one of the ushers will, um, will bring it to you. As baptism is a response to the gospel, as it, it, the kids' dedication is a, is, is a, is a parent respond, response to the grace of God towards them and the gift of life that is given to them, so is communion. Communion is a response to the gospel. It's a response to, to what Jesus did uh, for us in the cross of Calvary. In, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter says this, People like, how can we respond to the gospel? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Communion is a time where we respond to, to, to the gospel with a life of repentance, where we come before uh, God, we, we confess our sins, and we say, God, I don't want to do those sins no more. Please, Jesus, please, Jesus, help me to forsake sin and to pursue you. That's what communion time is all about. It's about us focusing and putting Jesus at the center of our life by confessing our sins, asking forgiveness, and repenting. 
So this morning, as you partake of the bread and the juice, respond to the gospel, the salvation through faith, by grace, in, that comes to us through Jesus. So respond to the gospel with a prayer of, repent, of confession and repentance this morning. Partake of the bread and the juice. Before I pray, I want to finish reading, reading verse 39 from, from Acts chapter 2. And Peter say, well, he says, repent and be baptized for everyone for in, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 39, he says this, for the promise is for you and for your children. The promises of God doesn't stop with us. It is for us and our children. It is a promise that God that comes to our family. Jesus promised to us of salvation is not only for us, but also for our children. So let us remember that we are, as a unit, family called to follow after Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you for the gift of salvation that comes to us through Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection. I pray, Father, that we as families, that we would focus on the response of the gospel by dedicating our kids to you, our families to you, by being baptized as we come to a saving knowledge of you. I just pray that all, all the, the, the church and, and all of those in our community will come together in order to help us grow in the image of you. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, for there are many. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Won't you stand and we're going to sing one last song together. your presence everywhere I go. I will bless your name, God, in the middle of it all. And when my peace is absent, the madness all around, you pull me close and you slow me down.
before you humbly at your feet Lord bringing an offering to you Lord and it's a sacrifice we want to hold on to those things that you've given us we want to have control Lord but you ask us to trust you to hand those things over whether it's the children finances, whatever it is that we hold as our treasure. But we need to hand those things back to you, Lord. Give you control, Lord. We know you will do what is best. Help us to trust you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Have a great week. Hope to see you next Sunday.